PowerPoint version. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back. Sorry about the slightly late start. Before we get started, just to say, just to remind you, please to do use the chat box to post any questions throughout the talk, um, which I will read out at the end. Um, and if you don't have a YouTube account, you will notice there's a link to a Google Doc, so you can write um, your questions there, and we will feed them through to the channel. Great. So today, um, we welcome Professor Bernard Crespi to our seminar series. Uh, Bernie is a professor of, evolution, professor of evolutionary biology at Simon Fraser University in Canada. He started out studying the social behavior of insects, and then moved on to bigger species like fish and eventually humans. He's contributed significantly to the field of evolutionary medicine with research on everything from cancer to COVID. And probably best known for his work on the imprinted brain hypothesis and of course its implications for understanding human cognition and mental health. Um, and now he has moved this research uh, to think about reproductive health. And so today he's going to talk about the evolutionary biology of risks for endometriosis and polycystic ovary uh, syndrome. Um, we're gonna share the screen now and I'm gonna put it over to you, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paula, and thank you, Gabriella, for the invitation to speak today. Today I'll be talking about the natural and sexual selection of endometriosis. This is work I've done with my graduate student, Natalie Dinsdale. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll start with uh, Darwin. I fixed a little typo in his book title here uh, for my talk. We're focusing on natural selection, and we all know what this is, slight variations in a trait, some of which are, are preserved due to higher fitness, but then there's also sexual selection, of course, which are advantages uh, solely with regard to reproduction involving intrasexual competition and intersexual choice. And today we'll be, we'll be focusing on uh, the evolutionary medicine of sexual selection uh, in the context of female reproductive disease. Now, uh, Darwin had difficulties with sexual selection. Uh, next slide, please. He, he went so far as to say that the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail whenever he sees it makes him sick. And he didn't mean physically sick, he meant intellectually sick in the context of uh, he didn't understand it. He didn't understand uh, how such a trait could evolve and be uh, maintained. Next slide. Sir, Sir Ronald Fisher came along later and started to provide an, an explanation for traits like the peacock's tail in the context of balances between sexual selection and natural selection. So we have sexual selection by mate choice for increased expression, the trait gets bigger and then it becomes so highly expressed that natural selection reduces its advantage and we end up with a balance between sexual and natural selection. And it is this uh, process of sexual selection pushing in one direction and then natural selection in the other that is involved in the evolution of traits that we uh, consider as uh, beauty related traits in, in one sex or the other. Next slide, please. So here we have it, the balance for beauty as an indicator of high reproductive value generally conceived and natural selection, lower survival, uh, less than optimal reproduction pushing back against it. Now variation in survival and reproduction are often of course associated with disease and this brings us directly into the realm of evolutionary medicine. Next slide, please. Here I've contrasted evolutionary medicine and uh, practice with uh, so-called conventional medical research. And conventional medicine focuses on proximate causes, the how questions, diseases represent breakdowns of some sort of human machine, main uses are uncovering mechanisms and developing and testing treatments. 
evolutionary medicine is quite different in focusing on the ultimate questions, the, 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 the why questions, and looking specifically at the evolution of risks for disease. So why are humans vulnerable to particular diseases with particular symptoms? And to do so, we need to connect the maladaptations of disease with the adaptations that have gone awry. And we're not treating people with evolutionary medicine. We're, we're using the theory to generate testable hypotheses that will indicate what data we should collect. And these two approaches are, are not just compatible, but they're also uh, synergistic. And working together between the how and the why can be a very efficient way to make progress on a whole range of, of medical questions. Next slide, please. So we're looking today at sexual selection in uh, humans. This is conventionally regarded as beauty in females, high reproductive value, high estrogen, low testosterone underlying these. By contrast, in males, sexual selection for strength, dominance, uh, resources in the context of high testosterone and low, low estrogen. And this is kind of a conventional view, and we're very used to it, but it is very unusual among animals. Can I have the next slide? And what's unusual about humans is that sexual selection in the context of, of quote unquote uh, beauty is mainly uh, the beauty of females as opposed to males. So in, in most animals with sexual selection, it is the males, the, the bright birds, the, the peacocks that are showing the, the sexual, sexually selected beauty traits. But in, in humans, it's, it's flipped around and it's, it's the females. And so the question then becomes, well, why is that? And what are the causes and what are, what are the consequences? And to try to get a handle on this, we can look comparatively across some of our closest relatives. If we look at chimps, we find that males actually prefer older females who are better mothers. In gorillas, there is uh, no evidence of male choice of females. But in, in old world monkeys, next slide, please. There's these very curious traits uh, called sexual swellings, which are just what they sound like. They're found in, in females, especially in species with large multi-male, multi-female groups and non-seasonal breeding. The peak of swelling corresponds with uh, peak fertility in a menstrual cycle. Males compete more over females with bigger swellings. So the evidence is from people who, who study these that the swellings appear to be female sort of beauty fertility indicators that motivate high male-male interest and, and competition and females thereby attract better mates. Now, males, humans also, of course, live in large multi-male, multi-female groups and have large and have non-seasonal breeding. So do they have any traits then that could be considered uh, analogous in some way to this? Well, let's, let's look first. Uh, next slide, please. Let's look first at the set of new and enhanced mating and reproductive system traits along the human lineage. And these traits, we can think of these as the, the adaptations that can go awry and give rise to male adaptations in disease, uh, especially for female reproductive uh, traits. So more invasive placentation, more pronounced decidualization, the endometrium, more highly developed menstruation that's associated with hemochorial placentation and extensive endometrial proliferation, essentially in preparation for the deep implantation of human embryos. Large heads of neonates, a difficult childbirth may be associated with uh, higher development of the oxytocinergic system for smooth muscle contraction, extensive maternal and allomaternal care, rapid reproductive rate, reproducing at about twice the rate potentially of related primates, large permanent breasts, hair on the head that keeps growing, 
high levels of gluteofemoral fat in females and mate choice by both males and females, but beauty more in females. So these are, these are the changes that essentially potentiate and structure the possible risks of particular forms of reproductive disease in human females. Next slide, please. So how do they connect? Well, we can think once again of sexual selection for indicators of high reproductive value, fertility and fecundity being balanced by natural selection against reproductive disease risks and against maladaptive extremes of adaptations. And in principle, these could apply to a range of female reproductive disorders. I've listed some of the main ones here, primary ovarian insufficiency, infertility, preeclampsia, recurrent miscarriage, gestational diabetes, postpartum hemorrhage, and the two that we'll focus on today, polycystic ovary syndrome, and especially endometriosis. Next slide, please. Endometriosis is, is a curious condition. It's, it's called a benign disease, but it is certainly not benign to the, the, the people who have it. It involves proliferation of endometrial tissue beyond the uterus, most often in the peritoneal cavity, the fallopian tubes, and the, the ovaries. The tissue uh, implants in these, uh, in these areas and it grows and it innervates and it becomes an inflamed. So instead of the, the embryo uh, implanting in the endometrial tissue, you have the endometrial tissue essentially implanting itself um, ectopically in areas outside of the uterus. Commonly causes considerable pain and infertility in about, uh, uh, to some level, in about a third of the people who have it. It's, it's a syndrome in that there's, there's a suite of symptoms that are found to variable degrees in different people. So somebody could have um, large development of endometriosis, but little pain, or somebody could have a small amount and, uh, and, and much pain. And these, these can vary. They tend to be associated, but there's a lot of variability. Now, what's paradoxical and curious from an evolutionary perspective is that it's found in about 5 to 10% of, of women, which is a very large proportion, especially for something that reduces fertility. So it's in about 200 million women worldwide. The costs are physical, uh, psychological, and uh, economic, and they are tremendous. The causes are basically unknown. As I'll discuss in a minute, it is associated, however, with low prenatal testosterone. And especially for our purposes, endometriosis has not yet been studied from an evolutionary medical perspective with regards to the evolutionary causes of risk. Why are human females vulnerable to a disease that looks like this? Next slide, please. So I've been working uh, with my student, Natalie Dinsdale, and my colleague, Pablo Nepomnashi, for the first couple of years. We published a series of papers on endometriosis, addressing the questions of how did risk for endometriosis and its symptoms evolve in humans? How is it related to other disorders? Uh, how are the ultimate causes of endometriosis related to the proximate ones, and how can it best be studied, prevented, and treated. Next slide, please. And to do so, we use something that I call the paradigm of diametric disorders. And these are pairs of disorders that one can consider as diametric or opposite to one another. These are just a simple consequence of the fact that biological, sim biological systems can vary in two opposite directions. So you can, can have increased or decreased activity or levels of some uh, biochemical. You can have some, something happening earlier or later, some trait developing to be, to be smaller or larger. And you tend to have normal distributions and these have, uh, these have extremes, of course, on, on, on either end. And the two extreme ends of the normal distribution are where you will tend to find uh, diseases or symptoms of disease. And there's a whole suite of diseases that 
show evidence of coming in pairs, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, cancer, neurodegeneration, uh, autism and psychosis, and, and others that I've, that I've summarized in an article uh, a number of years ago. Next slide, please. Diametric disorders are very useful to recognize. Uh, they provide all sorts of insights and they provide new ways of studying disorders because we have very clear patterns, opposite patterns of correlates and risk factors of the two diseases and their symptoms and their comorbidities and their responses to medication. So in particular, uh, risk factors for one disorder can represent treatments or preventatives for another disorder. So by looking at the two disorders, one can immediately gain insights into potential treatments. So there's reciprocal illumination of their causes. If you see a pattern in one disorder, if, for example, there's uh, low levels of brown fat in one disorder, well, you predict high levels of brown fat in the other, and then you ask, well, how is that connected with the other correlates of the disorder, and could it be involved in, in causality? So here's a little example, cancer and neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are well known to be um, show inverse comorbidity and represent a pair of diametric disorders. So what about endometriosis? Next slide, please. Well, the opposite disorder to endometriosis uh, is, by our reckoning, polycystic ovary syndrome. This is one of the other major common disorders of female reproduction found in about 5 to 10% of women diagnosed in the presence of two or three of the symptoms, uh, high testosterone, irregular or absent ovulation, menstruation, and so-called polycystic ovaries. And these are polyfollicular ovaries where the, 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 the development of the follicles has been uh, essentially uh, stalled at a relatively early stage. PCOS also involves high visceral obesity, insulin, insulin resistance, and uh, infertility. Now, for our purposes, what's especially interesting is that development of PCOS is strongly mediated by high prenatal testosterone. And this is the opposite to what we see in endometriosis. Next slide, please. So here is a list of the major traits that show opposite patterns in endometriosis and PCOS, all the way from life history traits down to early developmental traits. So in endometriosis, Menarche and menopause are earlier, they're later in PCOS. Similar opposite patterns for follicular genesis, uh, menstrual cycles, shorter versus uh, faster. BMI, waist hip ratio, fat distribution, muscle mass showing opposite patterns, low BMI, low WHR, gynoid fat, lower muscle mass and endometriosis. Opposite patterns for a variety of hormones, LH and FH, FSH, anti-malarian hormone ratios of estradiol to testosterone, oxytocin, and, and endorphin. And um, down there at the bottom, uh, in a genital distance. Uh, next slide, please. So we have good evidence for a, a suite of fundamental traits being opposite to one another. And this one down at the bottom, the antigenital distance, which is, um, is, is, this is a good indicator of prenatal testosterone as shown by extensive work in animals, extensive experimental work and knowledge of, 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 of mechanism. And this shows clear opposite patterns, shorter in endometriosis and longer in, in PCOS. And we think that prenatal testosterone is, is especially important in, not just in PCOS, but also in endometriosis. Next slide, please. So here is the evidence for endometriosis. Once again, shorter uh, AGD, AGD being the distance between the, the anus and the, the, a couple of measures on the, the genitalia, a good indicator of prenatal testosterone. It shows very, uh, there's very strong associations of shorter anogenital distance 
with endometriosis. And these, these effects are, are, are big. So for example, uh, women below the median were 41.6 times more likely to have deep infiltrating endometriosis uh, in this one study, which is an absolutely huge difference. So these, these, these effect sizes are, are big. There is something going on in, in early development when this trait is being formed that somehow mediates the later risk and form of endometriosis. Next slide, please. We have opposite patterns for PCOS, longer anal genital distance with big effect sizes, longer AGD, higher prenatal testosterone. Not in every study, but certainly in most of the studies that have been done so far. And recently, these, these sorts of effects for PCOS have been demonstrated to be transgenerational. So a mother who has PCOS will, because of her condition, have daughters who are exposed to relatively high prenatal testosterone and who will have a larger anogenital distance and who will tend to develop uh, PCOS uh, themselves. So we have not just genetic effects, these are both, these are both uh, polygenic sorts of conditions, but, but we have these sorts of trans, transgenerational uh, environmentally mediated uh, impacts. Uh, next slide, please. Now we've talked about prenatal testosterone and prenatal testosterone is, is not the, the only story when it comes to uh, early sexual development and, and differentiation. So here we have the bipotential genital ridge and in males we have the action of SRY activating SOX9 and anti-malarian hormone to cause progression of the malarian duct and development of the Wolfian duct under um, the effects of testosterone. And then in uh, XX women here, no SRY, there's a set of genes which are activated and act on the ovary. So you're, you're not producing as much anti-malarian hormone, so you retain the malarian duct and you have regression of, of, the, uh, of the Wolfian duct. So these, these genes here, SOX9, FOX cell 2, catenin B, etc., these we can think of these as sort of pro-male or pro-female genes. And if you look at the expression of these genes in, in adulthood, what you find is that the anti-female pro-male genes, anti-malarian hormone and SOX9, these are underexpressed in endometriosis, so lower pro-male um, lower pro-male and underexpression of anti-female, sorry about the double negative, and the, the pro-female anti-male genes listed here are, are overexpressed. So for all of these sort of major sex determining genes in endometriosis, you are seeing expression that is relatively in the female developmental direction. And so it's not just uh, prenatal testosterone. There's these genetic effects as well. And this is also telling us something very important. That is endometriosis is a disorder of early embryonic development. It is a, it is a DOHAD, developmental origins of, of adult disease. It is a DOHAD disorder. And we need to think about it in, in that context. Next slide, please. So overall, the picture looks like this in terms of the diametric hypothesis. Prenatal and uh, postnatal testosterone. Postnatal is associated with prenatal uh, lower AGD. It's associated with lower postnatal testosterone. Higher risk of endometriosis under low testosterone. Higher risk of PCOS under high testosterone. And uh, people in the middle having lower risk of both. Next slide, please. And one can, starting with prenatal testosterone, develop a, a, a scheme. And this is, <clears throat> this is not all uh, nailed down by, by any means. Some bits and pieces of this are, have strong evidence, but this is our overall uh, hypothesis for what's going on beyond the prenatal testosterone. 
In endometriosis, we have reduced frequency and amplitude of the GnRH pulses, LH and, and FSH, and these have the effects. Uh, LH leads to, to lowering of testosterone, testosterone higher aromatase leading to uh, higher estradiol, lower anti-malarian hormone, uh, increased follicular apoptosis, diminished ovarian reserve that you find in in, in endometriosis, uh, and 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 so on, and then the opposite sort of patterns in in PCOS. So one can essentially connect prenatal testosterone, uh, at least according to this model, with the, the 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 major endocrine features of the two disorders that give rise to their symptoms. Next slide, please. So we've talked about uh, prenatal effects in terms of testosterone and other genes involved in early sexual development. And then the next question becomes, well, is lower prenatal testosterone associated with more female adult trait expression and perhaps also with sexual selection? Um, is there a connection then, or what is the connection if there is between lower prenatal testosterone and testosterone in adults, and then the traits that you find in adults, and how are those traits related uh, to the, the symptoms and expression of endometriosis? Next slide, please. So here, um, we are essentially testing the hypothesis that women with endometriosis are showing a higher expression in the female direction of sexually dimorphic traits and female limited traits. So for, for female bias traits, they are more female. For sexually dimorphic traits is the hypothesis. And for female limited traits, they are increased earlier or faster. So the basic model is here, the bright red females with endometriosis, the pink females without it, and then males over here. Females with endometriosis are essentially, their distribution is a little bit off to the left. And here's a list of, of traits. Don't worry about the text in here. For each of these traits, one can look at the male-female difference, and one can look at the expression in, in endometriosis. So for anal genital distance, digit ratios, waist-tip ratios, inflammation, pain, serum testosterone, oxytocin levels, timing of menarche, speed of menstrual cycles, dysmenorrhea, and, and bleeding. For all of these, there, there is evidence that females with endometriosis are more female, if you will, for these traits or exhibit a faster or higher expression of these traits. Next slide, please. Now, pain is a trait of special importance in, in, in endometriosis. It's, it's really the most uh, directly problematic symptom, aside from infertility. And pain um, sensitivity, good evidence that it's higher in females than in males, also higher in women with endometriosis than in controls evidence that it's some evidence that it's lower in women with PCOS. It's decreased by testosterone. It's mediated by high inflammation and testosterone and inflammation trade off with one another. So typical women, higher sensitivity to pain. It's the sensitivity is mediated in correlational studies by serum testosterone, lower testosterone, higher pain. Experimentally, if you give women testosterone, it will reduce pain perception. Uh, experimentally, you can do all of this uh, with rats and antagonize the androgen receptor to, um, to increase uh, pain, decrease pain thresholds. Women with endometriosis showing more pain, also lower beta endorphin. If you give women with endometriosis a synthetic androgen, Danazol, it will reduce pain, and female rats treated prenatally with testosterone will develop a pain system which is similar to males. So this is telling us that the pain system 
is being affected by prenatal development, which is presumably what is, is also going on in humans. So some women with lower prenatal testosterone will essentially be programmed to feel more pain. And I write why down here because I tried to look for sort of evolutionary explanations for sexual dimorphism in, in pain and the various causes of pain expression. And I found absolutely nothing. And I was really quite horrified by this, given the importance of pain to, uh, to people's well-being. So there's, there's a few dozen uh, very important PhD projects uh, right there. Next slide, please. So lower prenatal testosterone is associated, as we've discussed, with shorter anal genital distance, a pro-female gene expression, more female trait expression, and endometriosis traits. And in animal studies, low prenatal testosterone is also associated with higher fecundity. This has been shown in mice, gerbils, rabbits, and cows. And in mice, gerbils, and rabbits, lower prenatal testosterone has been associated with this sexual, sexual selection, uh, higher quote unquote attractiveness to males. In experimental studies with these three taxa, males tend to prefer females that developed under lower levels of prenatal uh, testosterone, which of course makes sense in terms of uh, these individuals exhibiting higher fecundity. Uh, so next slide, please. And here's some, some, of the, some of the details here. In something like a mice, uh, we can get a, a measure of prenatal testosterone in females by whether they're flanked by no males, one male or two males. Males preferred females that were not flanked by any males. These, these have shorter AGDs, they have shorter, more regular estrus cycles like females with endometriosis do. House mice, same sort of pattern. Males prefer females with shorter AGDs. They, these had higher reproductive success. Mongolian gerbils, similar, uh, similar patterns also with regards to the, the menstrual cycles and also in the same sorts of patterns in, in domestic rabbits. So this is this is all this is all work which went on independently of, of any of these hypotheses derived here, showing that there seems to be uh, something quite fundamental going on in mammalian reproduction with regard to prenatal programming, uh, linking into the development of the HPO uh, axis and the expression of a variety of uh, uh, female female traits in, involved in mate choice and fecundity. Next slide, please. What about what about humans? What's going on here? We're rather different than, than rodents and, and rabbits. Um, there is some evidence that correlates of endometriosis, not endometriosis itself. Endometriosis itself tends to uh, reduce uh, reproduction reduces fertility. The correlates of endometriosis are associated with correlates of higher fitness in humans, as well as in these, as well as in the animals that I've showed you. There is a, a major haplotype of the follicle stimulating hormone uh, beta subunit gene that's associated with endometriosis risk, and it's also linked with a set of fitness related traits. Could I have the next slide, please? And then we'll come back to this one in a minute. So this is about 130 uh, kilobase haplotype, uh, sorry, uh, haplotype. And there's, there's, there's two haplotypes here that differ in their frequency. Uh, there is a haplotype that is linked with um, higher risk of endometriosis with fairly substantial effect sizes. The endometriosis risk haplotype is also associated with earlier age at first birth, lower risk of null parity, no births, higher number of lifetime births, and higher rate of dizygotic twinning. And the same haplotype is also linked with lower testosterone, lower LH, shorter menstrual cycles, heavier menstrual bleeding, earlier menarche, and menopause, all of these being phenotypes um, that are linked with endometriosis. And this haplotype is also associated with lower risk 
of, of PCOS. So this shows links with fitness and links with endometriosis uh, symptoms. We can go back a slide, please, if, if you would. Thank you. Endometriosis is also linked with a, a haplotype of a, a progesterone receptor insert that uh, we got from Neanderthals. And this haplotype shows lower rates of miscarriage and uh, it's linked to having more sisters and linked with higher risk, risk of endometriosis. So it seems to be linked with correlates of fitness. Uh, higher digit ratio has been linked to higher reproductive success of women in some populations. Lower WHR, strong evidence this is found in endometriosis, positively predicts conception rates, has been linked in some studies to, to fecundity. And then in the various animal studies, we showed evidence of uh, higher fecundity being linked to endometriosis associated traits uh, as well. Next slide, please. Oh, second, two more slides, thank you. So we've got a situation that may look something like this with higher reproductive performance in the, the middle here with regard to prenatal, postnatal testosterone, highest reproductive performance is towards the endometriosis side, but not, not, not too far, not out here in the endometriosis zone, but uh, over here uh, to the uh, little bit left of, of the average uh, showing highest reproduction. And then endometriosis manifesting as the effects of maladaptive extremes of uh, adaptations. We think in a really broad perspective that this continuum here uh, relates to uh, life history strategies and life history trade-offs. And there are actually looking at extremes of trade-offs to, to, to some degree, um, but we don't really have time to, to, to go into that uh, today. Uh, so we essentially have stabilizing selection here, but it's skewed over to the low testosterone side. Uh, next slide, please. A very similar pattern, amazingly enough, has been demonstrated in, uh, in, in cattle. Um, people who study cattle have taken to measuring anogenital distance in relation to fertility um, in the context of, of animal animal husbandry and animal breeding and producing more, uh, more cows and bigger cows. So here's anogenital distance in relation to fertility. Um, absolutely lovely uh, pattern, curvilinear pattern indicative of stabilizing selection, uh, highly significant, probably skewed over here a little bit to the left as well. This work by Sarah Batista at, at Ohio State uh, University. So stabilizing selection and then apparently a, a, a skew, uh, perhaps not as strong a skew as in humans, but a skew over towards towards the female, uh, towards the female side. There's not that many good examples of stabilizing selection out there. And I was really struck by this one. Can I have the next slide, please? So the overall hypothesis with regard to sexual and natural selection, male preference for higher male competition for females who show indicators of higher reproductive value. That's our sexual selection here. These include uh, more female, more in the female direction, facial, body, and voice features and other indicators or correlates of low prenatal testosterone. This essentially represents sexual selection for more female traits, which also involves selection for more alleles for endometriosis, because you're selecting, when you select for these traits, you're selecting for lower testosterone, you're selecting for lower prenatal testosterone uh, as well. And then because of the strong sexual selection, we end up with a considerable proportion of females at the maladaptive extreme of the more female traits as represented by endometriosis. And these females have uh, lower fecundity. Natural selection is working against this um, 
push of sexual selection towards uh, relatively low levels of, of testosterone. So this is, this is the model that we're, we're working with uh, overall at this point. I, I do want to mention that no data, new data has been collected in the context of testing this model. This is, this is all been done with existing data and there are many tests that need to be done to uh, evaluate it properly. Next slide, please. So we can visualize the overall model like this, lower prenatal, postnatal testosterone, leading to higher pain, higher inflammation, higher oxytocin as you find in endometriosis, also leading to relatively more female biased phenotypes, physical and psychological in the context of sexual, sexual selection via mate choice and male competition. Next slide, please. Question then becomes, what causes the lower prenatal testosterone, right? Um, and this is a really interesting and complicated question because it involves the mother and it involves the fetus and you have these transgenerational effects and you have genetic effects and you have environmental effects from things like endocrine disrupting compounds in, in our environment. And we have, we have some information about what uh, mediates levels of prenatal testosterone, but we, we, we really uh, don't have uh, enough. And this is an area that is absolutely crying out for further uh, animal and human studies. Next slide, please. So one can make a, a, a scheme here for the set of processes involved in sexual selection of, of endometriosis risk, selection for female reproductive traits, higher fertility, fecundity, and lower testosterone, higher female reproductive success, perhaps also faster female reproduction, shorter interbirth intervals, lower prenatal testosterone, postnatal testosterone. You also get indicators of lower testosterone and perhaps also higher estrad estradiol. And these indicators would be secondary sexual traits having to do um, with aspects of phenotypes that were not necessarily directly related to reproduction, but that were indicators of lower testosterone and thus indicators of uh, higher fertility and fecundity to a point. And down here in, in red, you have male preferences, sexual selection, and over here we have the evolution of what we consider as, as female, uh, uh, quote unquote, uh, beauty. Next slide, please. What is the significance of all this? Well, it's the first unified uh, theory, emphasis on theory here for causes of endometriosis and uh, PCOS. Uh, much more was known about PCOS and testosterone um, before this work. It has direct implications for, for therapy. The causes and treatments for endometriosis and PCOS are complementary and opposite to one another. So for example, there's danazole, a synthetic estrogen used to treat endometriosis, but it can generate to cause PCOS. Valproate reduces endometrial lesion size, induces major, major symptoms of PCOS. With regard to oxytocin, oxytocin antagonist can improve endometriosis symptoms of oxytocin itself, can alleviate some of the correlates of PCOS. Uh, letrozole and uh, uh, mifepristone, uh, both used to treat endometriosis and also used to generate PCOS in, in animals' models. So the causes of one disorder can be a treatment for the other, leading directly into um, hypotheses for therapy and new therapies. Next slide, please. So more specifically, one can look, think about how to apply these uh, I ideas. And, and I'm not an MD, so I'm not authorized in any way to make any specific recommendations. I can say what uh, the medical researchers should think about, what I think they should think about, and what they should measure. Start out with measuring correlates of endometriosis, especially AGD, serum testosterone, anti-malarian, hormone and levels of oxytocin. If a woman's AGD uh, and T are relatively low, 
this could, could indicate that uh, androgen treatments could be warranted uh, low AMH. There's some treatments to raise this. Tosiban, um, oxytocin receptor antagonist, high oxytocin, yeah, shows evidence of, of being involved in endometriosis as well. And it shows opposite patterns with uh, testosterone, low testosterone goes along with high oxytocin. Uh, one can uh, take androgen receptor uh, agonists to kind of dial up and androgen activity, trying to prevent androgenic side effects. And one can avoid contraception methods in women who are at risk or who have endometriosis. You can avoid contraception methods, certainly that lower testosterone, such as uh, most contraceptive pills out there cause um, notable reductions in testosterone. So these are all direct implications for research on treatments. I also wanted to point out some ancient treatments that make sense in the context of these, these modern ideas. Ancient treatments for endometriosis include drinking the urine of man or bull, uh, eating pomegranates, which have been shown to reduce salivary testosterone in humans, and eating ground, te ground goat testicles, presumably in, in sweetbreads or, or whatever, which is presumably a good way as well of getting uh, testosterone. Next slide, please. Uh, I also wanted to point out a number of factors that I think have prevented some of these ideas from getting out there earlier than, than they have. And these are sociological and psychological biases that, that influence research on testosterone and research, research on endometriosis. So when we hear testosterone, of course, we immediately think, well, this is a male hormone and what could it possibly have to do with female health and, and disease? Well, females have less testosterone, lower testosterone than males, but testosterone is directly and intimately involved in, in female reproduction, in ovarian uh, development, and optimal levels of testosterone are, are critical to the proper functioning of the HPO uh, axis. Uh, physiological research on testosterone, inflammation, health-related effects, and especially animal studies, focuses predominantly on males or orchidectomized males. I tried to come up with the evidence in the literature as best I could about testosterone's role in inflammation. So uh, in, in females, and there's really very, 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 very little. There's some evidence of inverse effects, high testosterone, low inflammation, low, low testosterone, high inflammation. That would be the endometriosis situation. There's some evidence of that, but there's very, very little. And this is, this is so fundamental that it, it's, it's really a crime that there's not more evidence on steroid hormones and inflammation in um, uh, studies on women or and female animals. There's also, I think, a bias in that relatively low levels of some hormone or biochemical tend to be overlooked as causes of disease. We tend to think of higher levels usually as being sort of the, the, the pathogenic sort of uh, direction. And of course, the vast majority of work, especially for endometriosis, uh, has focused on the proximate causes and has overlooked uh, an evolutionary approach uh, that I think can help to guide uh, guide research. Next slide, please. Uh, current projects in my group uh, with uh, Natalie, we have a paper under review on endometriosis PCOS in relation to pain and social cognition, testosterone and oxytocin influence social Cognition, we have evidence that for women with endometriosis, uh, higher pain is associated with better social cognition, which we think is pretty interesting. With uh, my student, Aidan Bushel, we're looking at the concordance of psychological and physical sex differences between men and women. So if, if someone is sort of towards the, if someone scores in sort of the more female direction, 
for uh, psychological tests that show sex differences? Do they also score in that direction for uh, physical traits? So what is the sort? What are the sorts of connections uh, here? Uh, we I I'm working with some folks at the uh, Norwegian Health Registry Population Health Linkage Christian page. They've got a, some wonderful um, data, including genetic data. We'll be able to look at endometriosis genetic risk scores in relation to a variety of traits. And we're applying the theory and testing hypotheses in, in animal husbandry and reproduction. Uh, for many, many years, people have rated cows for, for, for feminine looks. Do they look sort of more female in a uh, dairy cow or cattle sort of way? To what degree is this linked to, to AGD? How does that tie in with fertility? Might there be um, ways of influencing um, prenatal testosterone that would improve uh, animal husbandry and, and, and uh, production via um, some safe way to manipulate this system. I'm, I'm working on that with uh, Divakar Ambrose at uh, the University of Al Alberta. When we were doing this work for a while, it turned out that uh, my co-author uh, Natalie grew up on a, a cattle farm in, uh, in, in Alberta. And when she was in, in 4-H, she, she actually spent time uh, raiding dairy cows for their, for their feminine looks. And she may actually end up uh, getting back to that as part of her uh, postdoctoral work. Anyway, thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Um, that was really interesting. Uh, yes, we have some questions coming in. Um, first of all, one more a comment, I guess. Uh, Billy White was saying that uh, she was asking about the endometriosis adhesions that you referred to right in the beginning of the talk. Um, and she said she believes that the, the adhesions are similar but not identical to the endometrio endometrium when examined in the lab. So is the tissue the same or similar, I guess, is the question. Um, I'm not totally sure that I, that I understand the, the question. What is, what is really interesting about the, the nature of the adhesions is um, the, the, the embryo will, the, the normal implantation will essentially create kind of a inflammation. It's inflammatory process. It's, it, it, it's kind of a, kind of a, a wound there. It kind of settles and generates a, a, a wound. And then endometriosis does the, this, the same thing. And then it will preferentially uh, settle in areas where there's say a, a scar from a, from a cesarean. Now, this is actually used um, by uh, uh, um, doctors, uh, fertility docs who want to encourage impl implantation will actually give a woman what they call a scratchectomy. They'll, they'll give a little scratch to the endometrium and that will, that will encourage the, 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 and, and result in better, better implantation. But I'm not sure if that addresses the question. Yeah, she has a follow-up uh, question. The standard of treatment for endometriosis is excision, excision surgery, and many women with endo report that medications are largely ineffective. How does this complicate the theory of hormonal causes? Uh, well, it the theory the. The main treatment now is gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists and, and antagonists that essentially shut down the reproductive system. And there's there's bad side effects, for example, you get especially low estrogen and you get kind of a menopausal uh, sort of effect, which is you know which something that is not, not terribly pleasant if you're in your 20s or your 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 30s. And this is kind of the, the standard of care. And this is all this is of course also used in conjunction with um, with with surgery and surgery will often sort of have to be re repeated it's it's not really a, a a cure because it hasn't really addressed 
the, the causes in each particular woman. And there's probably a variety of particular causes and women with um, low prenatal testosterone, the causes probably predominantly involve low testosterone. And so for example, one could, in a woman who has low AGD, low serum testosterone, you can do your, you can do your surgery and then you can follow that up with, you know, low dose, relatively low dose testosterone and aromatase inhibitors to reduce getting too much, uh, too much estrogen. You're essentially trying to tweak the system to get it back towards the, towards the, the, the middle of, of, uh, of the distribution. Now, you know, the, with the GNRH, they're basically shutting it off, but there's other ways, there's other ways of, of shutting off the system, altering the system that are, that are more normal. And another way would be to say, well, okay, let's use a form of birth control that convinces the body that it's pregnant, right? Instead of using birth control pills that we know reduce testosterone and they're gonna exacerbate endometriosis probably because of that. Now, that said, we don't really know uh, there hasn't been that much research uh, on um, the various androgens and androgen receptor alterations uh, in the context of endometriosis. People used to give danazol back in the 90s, but in maybe half of women, there were androgenic side effects that were that that, that could be quite serious. Uh, but then the gr the GRNH agents came along, and they were shiny and new, and they kind of well, they seem to have fewer side effects, um, and so they kind of they kind of took over. That kind of ties into another question. Um, oh, I'm really interested in the effects of prenatal testosterone. Sorry, I was actually that's not the question I was thinking it was because the questions are moving up and down as I'm talking. Can you talk on the contraceptives and testosterone? Often doctors prescribe hormonal progesterone only coil for endometriosis. Uh, contraceptives and testosterone. So the, the proge progesterone only coil is often prescribed as a treatment. Yeah, well, presumably that, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this area. You noticed in the introduction that I began working on insects. So I've, I've you know, <laughs> I parachuted in here so I can say stupid things. So I'm potentially saying a stupid thing by saying that, um, I, uh, my supposition would be that this would be a, a method that would tend to reduce testosterone less than other methods, um, but th that's not something that I'm 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 uh, I'm sure about. I'm working now with uh, with um, on um, Ob Gyn in um, Australia, Susan Evans, who is an expert in this area and will prevent me from saying uh, stupid things, hopefully, if not. <laughs> okay. Uh Rebecca Britton asks, I recently read that there are associations between endometriosis and the microbiome. Do you have any thoughts about the role of microbes in the endometriosis um, or in endometriosis and how that would fit with your model? Uh, right, presumably the link there would be uh, through inflammation uh, potentially and different microbiomes being relatively adapted to inflammation or sustaining inflammation in kind of a, a, a positive feedback uh, cycle. So that would be my thinking and, and that could presumably be tested to, to, to see, well, do women have, women with endometriosis have relatively in, inflammation uh, associated microbiomes, and then the question becomes: Well, what's the cause and effect that uh, that is uh, that is going on there? So you would need some sort of experiments with animal models, presumably, uh, for that. Um, right, I'm moving to the top again. So, um, question from the form: Can one use the 2D40 ratio as an indicator of in utero testosterone, expo testosterone exposure rather than measuring AGD, which I guess is a, a kind of, you know, it, it must be easier to measure, I guess, finger ratio. Yeah, we found that out. We're trying, we're, we're doing a study now where we're, we're trying to get people to, to, to self-measure that. And it's not, it's not clear how, yet how well that is, that is, that, that's, that's going to work. It's, it's, it's certainly, you know, 
um, very straightforward in the, in the doctor's office with, with the nurse and so on. Uh, 2D40 has been shown to have a, a lot of replication problems. Mm -hmm. The thing about AGD is that you can relate it much more directly to the early sexual development and differentiation because it is, it's, it's directly related to the differential growth of the reproductive structures in males and females as opposed to the, the fingers and, you know, well, okay, um, there's something going on there, but it's, you know, sometimes it's, 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 there's really not much validation of 2D40 in terms of prenatal testosterone. And there's a huge amount of validation experimental in, in animals as well as in humans for, for, for AGD. So it's, it's a real nuisance to, to measure, but, you know, Get a nurse. Get a nurse in a white coat. Get an obgyne. Um, bring him into, you know, the hospital the clinic, and tell him about why it's important. I mean, these the, the, there's there's a lot of data on AGD out there in the context of endocrine disrupting chemicals, uh, especially in in males because these are having some pretty uh, pretty serious uh, pretty serious effects. So you know, it's it's getting measured a lot, but it's not. It's not getting. It's only getting measured in particular contexts. Thank you, um, Gabriella asks. Can you talk on the? Um, sorry, I'm asking the same question again. I'm really interested in the effects of prenatal testosterone. What might be the costs and benefits other than PCOS and endo of having high low prenatal testosterone? Uh, costs and benefits. Well, in terms of say aspects of life history. Uh, muscle development differs. So women with PCOS are stronger. They, they do have higher serum testosterone and they have stronger, a higher uh, lean, lean muscle mass. And so you've, you've kind of got a trade-off going on here between strength in women and uh, fertility and reproduction sorts of functions in women. And this, this is a pretty interesting trade-off in the context of, well, throughout the, the, the Neolithic and, and, and farming and a, a lot of cultures, females do a lot of hard work. And so having strong muscle mass and being able to do that work better, get more food, increase survival, increase at least the, the food production element, well, this, this could potentially be... Um, uh, significant uh, in, in, in that way. So I, I, we really think that there is kind of a missing trade-off here in females with regard to testosterone that, that has not been uh, that has not been well characterized, but there's really different um, processes in males and females. So high testosterone in females, you know, if it gets too high, it's associated with obesity. And uh, insulin resistance, uh, metabolic syndrome, but for males it's the opposite. Okay, uh, low testosterone is associated with obesity and metabolic syndrome, and so on. So the male, the males and females are exactly different mm -hmm. for this. But the question is, why is that? Well, nobody seems to know. Testosterone, the genetic basis, appears to be quite independent in males and females. It's just been discovered. Um, something important is going on there. Um, we don't know. Thanks. So uh, someone else is kind of, oh, I think there's a feedback. Sorry. Um, someone else is kind of following along from that question saying, um, I agree the effects of prenatal testosterone seem particularly relevant. In my own research, I've come up with findings that link the development of especially PCOS with early adrenarche and pubarchy. Similarly, I've looked at research that looks at PCOS, PCOS as metabolic syndrome that is worsened by nutrition and daily habits. So could it be an environmental maladaptation? I would say that I would say that it's it's both. So with with regard to your first point, the, the, the data that I gave on the timing of menarche and women with PCOS was for women of um, typical weight. And 
So the early menarche effects seem to be associated with uh, the higher body weight. And if one kind of adjusts or controls for that, the, the results are, the results are, um, um, are quite different. And the, sorry, the second part of that question. Um, oh, right. Well, absolutely. Um, the, the mismatch effects of PCOS are, are considerable. Um, it's associated strongly with obesity and insulin resistance. The most recent evidence suggests that the, the high testosterone prenatal is, is primary to those alterations. So it, it, is, it is causal for the insulin resistance and metabolic effects which I think is, is, is quite important. And it's absolutely the case though, that obesity is exacerbating and, and increasing the incidence of PCOS. I mean, uh, adipose tissue producing testosterone and serum testosterone getting higher and you get, a, you get the, the positive feedback, vicious, vicious cycle sort of, of situations. So it's, it's, it's absolutely a mismatch disease uh, uh, as well. And it's probably also the case for endometriosis uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, various mismatches contributing to, to considerably higher rates. But I haven't gone into any of that today, obviously. Question from Grazhnia Jasienska. Great and inspirational talk. Any ideas for prevention of endo and PCOS? Uh, well, I mean, a distance has some predictive value about liability. Um, the prevention would have to come from making adjustments to the, the androgen system, system of, of androgens to seek to adjust it essentially from the start, from from menarche or from around menarche. You know, I, I don't know how realistic it is to be able to do that sort of thing, but if one wants to get at the, the cause, then one wants to um, reduce the number of menstruations, you know, reduce the, the, the early, early menarche leading to more menstruations. So if you take, if you have a, a, a young woman who looks because of her genetic risk, because of her AGD looks to be high risk, then, you know, she goes on birth control method where that makes it so she doesn't menstruate, right? Which is kind of, you know, a better idea anyway, because menstruation is, is um, way more common now than it used to be, uh, of course. So that could certainly reduce risk. And then also uh, a little bit of, a little bit of boost to testosterone, I think both of those could certainly uh, reduce the probability of, uh, of onset in, uh, in that case. Thank you. And another question from one of our medical students. Can you touch on the difficulties or challenges that you have faced personally in, re in researching on such underfunded and under acknowledged conditions within the medical community? And I will add, this is a Canadian student of ours. I don't know if that is relevant specifically to Canada or not. Well, I had I, I had difficulty, considerable difficulty in uh, those those four papers. I had terrible troubles in publishing uh, a couple of them for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I, I the, the the reasons were kind of somewhat sociological uh, in part, uh, if you will. I think the fact that we were, we clearly didn't have medical credentials at all uh, did not help. We were probably not as precise in our language uh, about you know how the HPO works and so on as, as we could have been. We are squarely at the interface of um, evolutionary biology and health research and getting funded at that interface is is very difficult. So I want to work with this this Obgyn endo pain group at the hospital in, in Vancouver, but 
getting money is is really problematic. You, you write to a health agency and say, what is this evolution nonsense? And you go to the evo ecology evolution people and they go, well, you know, that's kind of health research there, bud. And none of those people have background in natural science engineering. Um, so getting getting the money you need for work that can be expensive is absolutely problematic. Thank you. I think we've come to the end of the questions. Thank you so much. Um, and yes, yeah, some of you will be joining us in a session after this. Um, take, take a minute to have a glass of water or something like that, but I will end the YouTube broadcast now. Thank you very much, Bernie. Thank you, Paula.